Six years on from the start of the financial crisis, Europe still faces huge challenges. So what exactly are the hurdles for Europe's companies and how can they be overcome? Goldman Sachs has asked that question of 31 of the region's top companies for a report it's published on Europe's corporate health. And here to talk through the sometimes surprising findings is Richard Tuft, who led the research. Richard, thank you very much for talking to the FT today. It's a pleasure, sir. Um, I wanted to start, start off by asking you about the vicious circles that Europe's companies sometimes seem to be found in. Yeah, I think um, the, the lack of growth in the post-financial crisis period has certainly led to uh, a series of cycles that a number of corporates have found themselves in. So the response to the financial crisis of austerity at the corporate level, I think, was very logical and sensible. But as that becomes embedded into the corporate process over a long period of time, and cost control, balance sheet improvement, and margin improvement are really what define corporate strategy, it's very difficult sometimes for managements to revert back to a more forward-looking growth and innovation strategy. And certainly when the continent has really struggled to find that catalyst to see underlying economic growth come back, there hasn't really been that stimulus to encourage companies to really start to think forward and invest. Is one of the things uh, corporate uh, bosses are worried about, is it, is it political risk? And in particular, are they concerned about rising Euro scepticism and voter support for that? I mean, how does that play into the whole picture? I think it's a, it's a symbol of the lack of visibility in Europe right now. And certainly managements are looking for confidence and they're looking for stability in order to make long-term investments. And if the political climate becomes less stable, more difficult to predict, and certainly the rise of uh, less moderate political parties is a symbol of that, then that just makes it more difficult to sign that uh, investment policy for a new plant or to hire that additional worker or to make that forward-looking statement from a business perspective. One of the points that you make is that um, on globally, Europe is really losing market share out of the top 2,000 listed companies. Uh, Ten years ago, Europe, com European companies accounted for 600. Now they account for less than 400. So does that mean we no longer can compete globally? I think a big function of that is the growth of China and, and the businesses that have built up around the Asian region as that part of the world has gone through its period of economic maturity. So to some extent, the size element of it is more about global economic realignment and rebalancing rather than a statement about European corporates. And it is the case that Europe remains the wealthiest bloc as far as a trading region is concerned around the world. We have a lot of strong embedded advantages within the European economy and a number of the multinational corporates that operate there, particularly in areas of specialization, expertise, heritage, these are areas where European corporates excel around the world and exporting that to the rest of the world is a significant opportunity for the European economy. Uh, talking of heritage, I mean, one of, the, what, one of the things that I found slightly worrying in your report <laughs> is that you suggest that one of Europe's, some of Europe's comparative advantages are in tourism, luxury brands and our universities. Um, do you envisage a future where of sort of theme park Europe where, um, you know, with no real industries left at all? I don't think we envisage Europe being just a destination for, for other parts of the world. Certainly that's an area of potential strength. I mean, it's it's a, an opportunity for Europe to take advantage of the fact that it's got tremendous culture, it's got tremendous heritage, it's a beautiful place to come and visit for, for wealthy tourists from around the world. But that said, Europe has significant advantages in terms of innovation, in terms of high-end industries such as manufacturing, pharmaceuticals. These are areas where European companies lead the world and that's an opportunity for them to embed that knowledge and export it to developing economies around the world. I mean, because that's one of the strongest messages from the report, isn't it? I mean, you have a number of policy recommendations, but in a sense you turn the debate on its head and say some of the things that are seen as Europe's biggest weaknesses, in fact, could be a source of strength. Could you give us a bit more detail about what, what those are? I mean, a number of, Europe is maturing, and from a demographic perspective, the population is aging. It's a relatively small geographic landscape relative to other parts of the world, and so issues such as urbanization, issues such as process efficiency, de dealing with waste, these are all things which the European continent is having to deal with 
at a rate which is faster than other markets around the world. And so developing expertise in the businesses that go around an aging population, for example, is an expertise that Europeans can get ahead of and then potentially sell and export that expertise to other industries and other places around the world as they reach that milestone in their population development uh, later down the track. So places, things like asset management, wealth management, healthcare, managed care around hospitals, these are all businesses which European companies can develop significant expertise in and develop that solution for the rest of the world to consume. Yes, if, if policymakers and companies make the right decisions, of course. One of the um, other su slightly surprising things in the report um, is the suggestion that clearly a lot of company bosses made to you that anti-big business rhetoric mm. is really affecting the landscape. And that, I found that surprising because obviously you expect that from the head of a bank, but perhaps not the head of some of these big industrial companies you've, you spoke to. Why are they worried about this? I think they're looking for a change. They're, they're looking for a pathway forward and to get back to the normal business planning cycle. I think the frustration that we encountered in talking to business leaders around Europe was around the continued lack of growth in the European market and some of the political and social impacts that that's starting to have. And so really what they were looking for or what they were expressing was a desire for a, a public-private collaboration to try and get Europe back onto a more forward-looking positive footing and as a result, they were expressing that frustration uh, through that channel. Richard, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. It's a pleasure.